Hello and welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast. If you're new to us, you may not know that we produce a number of other history-related podcasts as well. Angus, the other half at the History Network here, does his own podcast dedicated to World War II, which you can find at www.podcast.com. Angus continues to produce two episodes monthly, and it's an eclectic mix of Second World War-related topics. MacArthur was a notable episode, and the latest looks at the PBY Catalina flying boat, where Angus actually talks to a guy who owns a share in one and flies it. We also produced the podcast for Ancient Warfare magazine. You can find them at www.ancient-warfare.com. And if wargaming is your thing, then we produce the Wargaming Soldiers and Strategy podcast. In the latest episode, out Monday 3rd of October, the guys will be looking at all things terrain. So you've plenty to keep your ears and eyes busy there. And you can find links to all of these by heading to www.thehistorynetwork.org. Incidentally, we've a nice big shiny donate button on the homepage at the website, and if you feel the urge, we'd welcome that most gratefully. If you want a bit of listening bang for your buck, then in the store at the website you can find our past seasons, all packaged up as chaptered files for download. These seasons vary from between around two and a half hours to over five hours, and they are just two pounds each. Thank you for your continued support. The History Network.org podcast, Season 21, Episode 7, The Hanseatic League. Around the 12th century, German regionalism was very strong, with the northern lowlands having their own distinct languages of Saxon and Frisian. Efforts by imperial central government to unify provincial and legal frameworks while attempting to impose Middle High German as the official language, failed. The importance of towns within this regionalism cannot be overstated, with there being the focus and strength of the local communities with the power to affect terms of trade, rights, position. It was therefore a fertile period for the emergence of urban leagues, and in 1241 the first formal alliance between Lübeck and Hamburg was strengthened when they agreed to jointly protect trade routes on sea and land. This was the first formation of what would become the Hanseatic League. This league would expand, fight, defend, trade and negotiate across the next 400 years until Europe no longer needed it. But its legacy can still be seen and found today. Lübeck became a base for the merchants from Saxony and Westphalia, trading eastward and northward. Another 25 years or so of cities forming guilds, German Hansa, would continue before any official use of terms like Hanseatic League would start to show up in documents. The intention of these guilds was to come together to increase trading with towns overseas, especially in the economically less developed eastern Baltic. This area was a source for timber, wax, amber, resin and furs, along with rye and wheat brought down on barges from the hinterland to the port markets. These towns and guilds raised their own armies, with each guild required to provide levies when needed. The Hanseatic cities came to the aid of one another, and commercial ships often had to be used to carry soldiers and their arms. Lübeck's location on the Baltic provided access for trade with Scandinavia, putting it in direct competition with the Scandinavians who had previously controlled most of the Baltic trade routes. A treaty with the Visby Hansa put an end to this competition. As more trading routes opened up, more trading posts, or contours, were built. Other such alliances formed throughout the Holy Roman Empire, yet the League never became a closely managed formal organisation. Assemblies of the Hanseatic towns met irregularly in Lübeck for a Hansatag, Hanseatic Diet, 
from 1356 onwards, but many towns chose not to attend nor send representatives, and decisions were not binding on individual cities. Over the period, a network of alliances grew to include a flexible roster of 70 to 170 cities. The League succeeded in establishing additional contours in Bruges, Bergen and London. The London Contour, established in 1320, stood west of London Bridge near Upper Thames Street, the site now occupied by Cannon Street Station. It grew into a significant walled community, with its own warehouses, wayhouse, church offices and houses, reflecting the importance and scale of trading activity on the premises. In addition to the major contours, there were Hanseatic built, owned and run ports. Invariably, with all this trading, negotiating, routing of goods, things sometimes didn't go so smoothly, and there were many wars and conflicts, not to mention the League's need itself to collectively try and subdue the effect of pirates on the sea routes. A good deal of the 15th century saw the Hanseatic League in conflict with various opponents. English, Dutch and Danish merchants wanted to trade themselves directly with Baltic cities. The first of these trade wars of the 15th century was the Dano-Hanseatic War, which lasted nine years from 1426 to 1435. The Danish-dominated Kalmar Union, Denmark, Norway and Sweden, fought the Hanseatic League, led by the free city of Lübeck. The precursor to the conflict occurred when Danish King Eric opened the Baltic trade routes for Dutch ships and introduced a new toll for all foreign ships passing the Sound Jews. Six Hanseatic cities, Hamburg, Lübeck, Lüneburg, Rostock, Stralsund and Wismar, took exception and declared war. Two of the Hanseatic League involved, Rostock and Stralsund, signed a separate peace agreement in 1430 after years of toing and froing in the conflict. Lübeck, Hamburg, Wismar and Lüneburg, however, continued the war until they agreed an armistice in 1432 and started peace negotiations. Meanwhile, an anti-Danish revolt broke out in Sweden, and in 1434 Eric had to agree an armistice with the Swedes too. In April 1435, he signed the Peace of Vordingborg with the Hanseatic League and Holstein, followed by the Peace of Stockholm with Sweden a few months later the same year, finally bringing an end to this trade war. These peace agreements saw the Hanseatic cities accepted from the Sound Jews, but they did have to accept Dutch competition in the Baltic trade. The Danish Duchy of Schleswig was ceded to the Count of Holstein. Sweden's autonomous rights and privileges were extended. Only three years later, the Dutch Hanseatic War began in 1438, and this time saw the Hanseatic League pitted against the Burgundian Netherlands, a not too cohesive hotchpotch of bishoprics, counties and duchies originally established in 1384. Incidentally, the Burgundian Netherlands would be de-established around a hundred years later when they fell to the Habsburg dynasty in 1482. But for now, they fought the Hanseatic League once again over the latter's control of Baltic shipping. This was a shorter war than the Dano-Hanseatic conflict, and in 1441 the Treaty of Copenhagen was signed, which authorised unlimited Dutch access to the Baltic, and thus allowed them to vastly increase their control on herring fisheries, the French salt trade, and the Baltic grain trade. A few years later, in 1447, King Henry VI of England revoked all Hanseatic trade privileges within his kingdom after being put under pressure from his own trader subjects who wanted their own access and rights in the Baltic. Twenty-odd years of tit-for-tat trade-motivated kidnappings, hijackings, sinking of each other's vessels and embargoes ensued, including an eight-year armistice from 1456, but eventually the bad feeling spilled over into war from 1469 and lasted for five years. Danzig and Lübeck put up the main forces, supported by the cities of Hamburg and Bremen. The city of Cologne opposed the war and, as a result, was temporarily excluded from the League for this. 
From 1472 onwards, the war was fought mainly by the use of commerce raiding. The war finally concluded with the Treaty of Utrecht, 1474, which declared peace between Lübeck and the German Confederation with England, restoring the Hanseatic privileges in the Port of London. These privileges included immunity for Hanseatic franchises from the tonnage and poundage levy. The Treaty of Utrecht, 1474, granted the League ownership of the London Steelyard premises, which were secured this way until the middle of the 19th century as Hanseatic property in London. Londoners rioted in the streets in protest at the unfair treatment of the city's merchants. The League was also guaranteed access to the ports of Hull, Lynn and Boston, and a claim on customs dues to the sum of £10,000 per annum. The treaty was a partial defeat for the English. They yielded franchises and tax revenues in order to gain peace in Germany and trade with the Netherlands, but English trade would virtually halt with Germany until the time of the Elizabethans, but it never recovered in the Baltic. The Hanseatic warehouse in King's Lynn was constructed in 1475 as part of the Treaty of Utrecht 1474, allowing the League to establish a trading depot in Lynn for the first time. It was used as such until 1751, and is the only remaining building of the Hanseatic League in England. All these rights and privileges did not, however, halt the League's long-term decline across Germany. At the start of the 16th century, the League found itself in a weaker position than it had known for many years. The rising Swedish Empire had taken control of much of the Baltic Sea. Many Hanseatic contours were closing, and its collection of cities began to break apart as they put self-interest ahead of Hanseatic loyalty. Finally, the political authority of the German princes had started to grow, and in so doing, constricted the independence which the Hanseatic League had enjoyed. Although the League tried to deal with some of these issues, it could not prevent the growing mercantile competition, and so its long decline continued. More contours began to close, Antwerp in 1593, London in 1598, and the gigantic Adler von Lübeck warship, which was constructed for military use against Sweden during the Northern Seven Years' War of 1563-70, was never put to military use. It epitomised the vain attempts of Lübeck to uphold its long privileged commercial position in a changed economic and political climate. Throughout the 16th century it was dogged by internal squabbles and social and political changes, much of which accompanied the Protestant Reformation and the rise of Dutch and English merchants. Its troubles didn't end there. The incursion of the Ottoman Empire upon its trade routes and upon the Holy Roman Empire itself, meant that by the close of the 16th century, the League had effectively collapsed. Only nine members attended the last formal meeting in 1669, and only three, Lübeck, Hamburg and Bremen, remained as members until its final demise in 1862, with the creation of the German Empire under Kaiser Wilhelm I. Hence today, only Lübeck, Hamburg and Bremen retain the words Hanseatic City in their official German titles. The legacy of the Hansa also lives on in several names today. The German airline Lufthansa and the football club FC Hansa Rostock perhaps being the most notable. For Lübeck, its anachronistic tie to a glorious past remained especially important in the 20th century. In 1937, the Nazi party removed this privilege through the Greater Hamburg Act, after the Senate of Lübeck refused Adolf Hitler permission to speak in its city during his election campaign. He held the speech in Bad Schwartau, a small village on the outskirts of Lübeck, and subsequently he referred to Lübeck as the small city close to Bad Schwartau. Would you like to write a script for us? Many of our most popular episodes have been written by listeners. So why not drop us a line with an idea for your script, info at thehistorynetwork.org. And it's the same address if you just want to suggest a topic for us to cover sometime in the future. Do go along to the website, www.thehistorynetwork.org, 
where you'll find all the information about those other podcasts we produce, which I told you about at the beginning of the show. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the historynetwork.org podcast, researched and read by Nick Barker.